Hello friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. Today we have something quite different. We are looking at this uh, 1950s uh, Soviet watch, a Pabjeda watch. So let's get into it. Our glorious nation will make a wristwatch and we will name it Victory. That's strange, I didn't know Stalin spoke English. Anyway, that's exactly what they did. The uh, Pabjeda, or Pobeda we'll call it, uh, wristwatch, uh, the name actually means victory. And it was indeed uh, made to commemorate the victory over the Nazis in the Second World War. It's a quirky and quite uh, unique watch in a lot of ways. We'll uh, see a lot more of that. This one is actually gold-plated, which is quite uh, uncommon. And not really in line with this whole uh, Soviet ethos of being very uh, down-to-earth, no-nonsense. And a funny thing happened. After I took the strap off, the watch started running. And we see it actually doesn't look bad at all. It's a high amplitude, a little bit high beat error, but not too bad. So this is definitely workable. So let's take the case back off. And we can get the first look of this marvel of Soviet engineering. Caliber 2602. It's a version of the R26 caliber, which is actually based on a French caliber of our old friend Lip. The Lip sold the design of their uh, R26 model to the Soviets, and they basically just copied it, and I called it uh, K26, and a 2602 is just a version of that. The Soviet Union was, of course, uh, known for their five-year plans, and everything was planned. So they basically told uh, various factories to start making this watch, and they did. Millions of them. Actually, at some point, uh, the Russian watchmaking industry made more watches than anyone else in the world. And the Pobeda. Victory watch was a big ingredient to that. Now, as mentioned, most of uh, these uh, watches were very down to earth, very uh, pragmatic, as you probably already saw from the movement. But the dial and hands, and also the case on this watch, uh, is definitely a little bit more uh, high grade, or dare I even say fancy. How very capitalist. Let's get the hands off uh, the watch. We see uh, the paint. It's not loom, it's just paint. In the, our hand has uh, broken up a little bit. So we're going to have to fix that. Let's now first get all the hands off and the dial as well. And we can see what's underneath. We struck oil! So I suppose it's a pretty well-known fact that uh, Russia or the Soviet Union have among the biggest oil reserves in the world. That's not going to last if they put it all into their watches. This is the most insane amount of oil I've ever seen in a watch. No wonder the watch didn't want to start running. But it's also pretty amazing it runs as well as it does when it actually does start. But I'm gonna need more toilet paper. So let's see if this is uh, something that uh, is uh, sustained. Well, I think we can say safely that it is so far. See, even this uh, little uh, dial washer on the hour wheel 
leaves a footprint of oil. There's no calendar works to bother with. Let's just take off the cannon pinion. Sorry about this being out of focus. The Soviet Union didn't actually have a watch industry until uh, around 1930. They took advantage of uh, the financial crisis in the US and uh, bought up a couple of uh, failing uh, companies uh, there. They actually even imported uh, around 20 watchmakers from a couple of these factories to help them uh, train the Soviet uh, watchmakers. And man, look at this. This is insane. Anyway, uh, but those uh, movements, uh, the watches they made were pocket watch movements. And in 1945, Stalin uh, then ordered uh, the making of a new wristwatch to commemorate the victory of uh, the Nazis. And for that, they needed the uh, wristwatch movement. And there were a few factories uh, in the Soviet Union uh, capable of making watches. But they had actually packed up the factories and moved them to Siberia due to the uh, Nazis' early advances on the Eastern Front. So after the war they had to more or less start from scratch. And they then approached uh, some Western companies and ultimately decided to go with this movement from uh, the French manufacturer Lip. And the key criteria for choosing this movement was uh, reliability, repairability, and it could be mass-produced cheaply. The original lip movement had the screws in the balance wheel and uh, the first uh, versions of the Pobied also. But this one has a monometallic uh, balance. And interestingly, it also has a Breguet hairspring. Some Breguet overcoil. That is an interesting choice for a very pragmatic movement. That said, there were actually movements that were decorated, even with the Cote de Genève. But uh, most movement produced were very down to earth, like this one. No decadent uh, decoration on this movement. So we saw already that the watch actually ran well once it got uh, started. So there doesn't seem to be a problem with uh, any of the wheels. We're checking anyway, just to make sure. As you see, the center wheel does not uh, have a jewel. So that's a place where you will often see wear. Also in the barrel bridge to a little bit less degree. Let's take the train bridge off. And it's uh, quite clear that someone basically just soaked this whole movement in oil. Even the screws are full of oil. Um, voila! Pay dirt. In the watchmaking, they basically say that if you can see the oil, it's too much. 
And I think even Stevie Wonder could see all this oil. Or smell it. But for the reliability, there was even a kind of joke between uh, the Russian watchmakers that you shouldn't uh, service a Pobiera that was running as that might uh, damage the structure of the dirt alright we're over at the dial side We'll loosen the setting lever spring a little bit before we screw it off. And more oil. Parts are even slippery from all this oil. I don't know how long it is since uh, this watch was serviced. It's definitely uh, not recent. And with this uh, volume of oil, it's uh, going to take a while before it uh, congeals. So it could easily be 30 years or more. And no markings in the case back, so I uh, really wouldn't know. So uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, finishing also. <laughs> okay, finished. What you mean finishing? We finished the work already. We make the part finished. Yup, твою мать, блять. So I must admit my Russian is a little bit rusty. Back in the army in Norway, we learned a few uh, phrases. Among them the one I just used, so my apologies to any Russian speaking viewers. It is not directed at you. Those uh, three words I said uh, are an uh, imperative uh, encouragement to have uh, indecent uh, interaction with your uh, female parent. So don't use those words. We're going to clean up uh, the main plate a little bit more before we put this into the cleaner. The simple reason is that we don't want to completely contaminate the cleaning fluids. And with all this oil, there's of course also a chance that uh, the jars would actually overflow. So just the strip down takes like twice as long because we have to clean all the parts. But we're finally almost ready for the cleaning machine. I'm gonna peg out all the holes. And as mentioned before, we're not trying to get the peg wood through the jewel holes. We just want to loosen any the uh, dirt that's really gunked up and is sort of clogging the holes. And there is actually also a chance that if you press too hard, you will damage the jewels. So don't do that. Let's look at the barrel as well. And is there more oil? 
Not sure there is any more oil in the whole world. But yeah, there is. It's a very generous oiling in this movement. So the Möbius D5 oil or HB1300, they generally are sold in 20 milliliter bottles. And those bottles will last most watchmakers maybe two, three years. But the guy oiling this watch, he must be the best customer Möbius has. The ranking is probably him and then the US. Let's just uh, finish pre-cleaning these parts, then we can put them into the basket for the cleaning machine. We're also going to clean the pivots. We're using uh, something called an Eve stick or Eve rod. It's some sort of a rubber silicon compound. That removes the dirt from the pivots, very useful. We're using these uh, tiny baskets for the small parts. I mostly use them for the wheels, also the pallet fork and the jewels, that kind of thing. And then we can put all the other parts in and uh, get ready for the cleaning machine. My cleaning machine is an Elma machine. It's an automatic because I'm lazy. But it works the same way as uh, manual machines. It takes a little bit more than half an hour. So uh, while we're waiting for that, let's look at the case and the crystal. It's not so easy to see, but uh, the crystal is uh, very scratched. So we're just going to replace it. And there's actually not a lot of dirt on the case, comparatively. It's also in a good condition, uh, generally. The thing is, I wouldn't say I trust the gold plating too much. So we're not going to polish this one in uh, any meaningful way. But we will run it through the ultrasonic. Alright, we got uh, the movement back from the cleaning machine. This is of course a no shock setting movement. By the way, you can probably hear this uh, very active birds outside my window. That's a nice thing. So we uh, wound the mainspring. We're not changing it. We saw the amplitude was uh, more than good enough. So we're gonna oil the barrel a little bit. Somehow I didn't capture putting the mainspring in, but uh, you can see other videos for that. Now we're getting the barrel arbor back in place. I'll put a little bit more grease on top of the mainspring also. Not as much as was there before. Don't worry, we're not putting the barrel in upside down, but we are putting a little bit of HP 1300 on the arbor. And we'll flip it and do the same on the top side. Of course, the top side is the one with this beautiful finishing. But uh, being a little bit more serious about it, this was not a watch that was meant to compete with uh, Russia Raw and the like. It was meant to be a very cheap but reliable alternative. 
for people who didn't have that much money and in that sense it's an extremely successful watch I'm in no way an expert in these uh, movements or watches but they were made in millions and millions and as we can see from this one they run even at a high amplitude and relatively good uh, otherwise without probably having been serviced for god knows how long so considering the goals for this watch it's nothing less than a massive success see that the train runs nicely always fascinating to see With the wheel train in place, we can uh, turn the watch over, put in the keyless works. There are no complications whatsoever in this watch. No date, no turbio, uh, a lot has happened in uh, Russia as well since uh, Stalin nowadays uh, there is a relatively flourishing uh, watch industry there you have some uh, rather high-end watches even selling for uh, thousands of uh, dollars or euros so companies like uh, Vostok, Polyot doing well And uh, coming from a nation that uh, is a neighbor to Russia and to the Soviet Union, of course, in the old days, there was always this notion that the Russians were kind of brilliant in one sense, but also that they didn't really give a damn. So you get a little bit of that feeling with this watch. It's just not uh, adorned in any way purely functional but it's fantastic value for money of course remember that this was a watch that was made for the factory worker for the farmer for simple people maybe not this one with the gold case or gold plated case but still and uh, you would get these watches for like 10 rubles or something like that I'm sure there are people out there who know a lot more about this than I do. So uh, please feel free to use the comment field to uh, educate us. All right. Just about finished with the keyless works. Just gonna grease the contact points a little bit. We use a grease wherever uh, metal rubs against metal. So typically the keyless works. And we use a D5 or similar for the cannon pinion and also for the different posts for the wheels. For the wheel train, we use D5 for the center wheel and then 9010 for the rest of the wheels. I 
and we also use d5 in uh, these spots where metal rubs against metal low rotational speed So the first uh, Pobieda watch uh, came out in 1946, so a year after the Second World War. And I believe it was produced until at least 1980 with the same movement, even without shock settings. But I have read somewhere that it also was produced until the 2000s, which sounds crazy. Again, if anyone knows better, then please uh, let us know. We uh, fix a drop, the uh, pallet fork, and we're going to oil it with some 941. So let's go to the close up of that. Let's just put a little wind on movement first. So we're oiling the exit pallet. The oil will stay a little bit better on the tip of the pallet, on the face. And then we spread that oil over the different uh, teeth on the escape wheel. And with these uh, watches, uh, with uh, typically 15 teeth on the escape wheel, we can oil three times. And then we flip the teeth forward five times uh, for each oiling. All right, let's put the balance back on and see how it does on the time grapher. I missed uh, taking video of uh, oiling the pivots. But they are oiled and we see that the amplitude is uh, good the beta is uh, much too high so we're gonna have to rectify that now as i got uh, the movement back from the time grapher the index fell off we have to take this off anyway but uh, that's kind of interesting So the way we have just beat error with this uh, old style movement is that we actually move the hairspring on the collet where it is fixed to the balance arbor. And we do that with uh, some kind of tool. Here I'm using a tiny screwdriver. We basically just move the hairspring a little bit in the opposite direction of where the beat error lies tiny little bit and given that we have no way of seeing if it's enough we probably have to do it several times in fact for this watch i had to do it three times in order to get to a satisfactory result Let's uh, rebuild the balance cock on these old movements without a shock setting. You pretty much always have to screw the capsule in from the underside. So it's a little bit more cumbersome. And then we also oil it from the underside. Especially on the Breguet hair springs, it can be a bit tricky to get the stud back in the holder. So I'm using an old oiler. And 
and with the Breguet uh, overcoil. It's important that uh, the overcoil part of the hairspring is in between these uh, index pins. So we're using uh, the oiler or the broken oiler to make sure it's uh, in the right place. Otherwise the watch is not going to run uh, properly. A little bit fiddly, but uh, we'll get there. Let's give the watch a good wind and then we can see how it's doing on the time grapher. So we see we got uh, the beta error out. So now it's really a matter of trying to adjust the watch to run uh, well. And well is a little bit of a relative uh, term. We see the graph is uh, quite okay. A little bit irregular. I'm still adjusting it at this point, but uh, it's not completely linear. But also our ambition level for this watch is a bit lower. We'll be happy if it varies with, let's say, 15 seconds per day. So we're going to try to put it to run uh, 6 to 8 seconds fast, fully wound. And as the mainspring winds down, the watch will go a little bit slower, so all in all that should be good. I'm not showing the positional errors here. They're actually pretty good, about 10 seconds different in the different positions. So that's perfectly fine. All right, we're going to be happy with this. Very, very good. Dobro. And then we can turn to casing the movement. So we put on the hour wheel. Put on the, the dish washer or dial washer rather. Although a dishwasher would probably have less oil in it than uh, this watch originally did. The dial is uh, in very fine condition actually. The design of it is a bit a matter of taste. It's quite uh, typical Russian. But uh, we saw that the hands, the paint inside the hour hand was broken. And of course we have to change both hands then. Well, not change the hands, but uh, repaint the hands. Because if we only repaint uh, the hour hand, then uh, the other one would be uh, different. I do not have this color. So we're just going to do it uh, black. I know that's not the original color. But honestly, I'm not really too bothered about it. So we're just going to put on some black paint here. We always put uh, the paint over the loom on the underside of the hand, of course. The minute hand is always a little bit trickier because it's longer, so you have to stretch this paint or the loom uh, much more. clean the hands a little bit before we put them on. Well, that looks pretty good. So it sounds like my uh, colleague is still working on that Casio. Not gonna disturb him this time.
Very durable, those Cassias. So we've got the hour hand on. Just checking that it doesn't rub on the dial or on the second hand. And then we can put uh, the minute hand on. And again we test that the hands don't rub on each other or the dial. Now here's a fun uh, little uh, close-up. As I was working on the hands, I noticed that uh, the hour hand is actually a lot wider on one side than the other. So you can see it's not symmetric. It's a little bit this uh, mix of brilliance and like, yeah, I don't really care attitude. You might remember that a few years back uh, there were two Russian uh, space rockets that crashed right after takeoff. They took off and then it just uh, turned their uh, noses towards Earth and just crashed. And they found that the reason for the crashes were that a gyro that was uh, meant to stabilize the rocket was put in upside down and there were hammer marks on them. So basically the engineer tried to put it in and didn't go in so he just hammered it in place true story okay we found a new crystal this time we're going to use this uh, simple uh, burgeon tool We use this uh, tool to compress the sides of the crystal a little bit and then we can just press it on into the case. Simple but uh, works well. And then before putting the movement in the case, we want to make sure there is no debris, no dirt on the inside of the crystal. So use some uh, Swiss Play-Doh for that. Now you might remember from uh, the disassembly that it has this very interesting uh, case clamp. Very primitive. But it works. Pretty much a perfect example of the thinking that went into these watches. Extremely pragmatic, cheap to produce, very reliable. Okay, we put the crown back in, the stem, put on the case back. We're going to put on the strap. And I believe this strap says uh, made from man-eating bear. Could be mistaken. But I'm about 99% confident that's a good uh, translation. It's actually a good looking strap. Looks a little bit like uh, ostrich. So before we uh, see the watch on the wrist, Let's see what's coming up on this channel. And there we have it. A Soviet uh, 1950s Pobjeda. Doesn't look uh, half bad, to be honest. Not quite my style, but uh, it's uh, not a bad looking watch. I hope you liked this video. If you did, then uh, click like and subscribe. Then you'll be notified of new videos. We'll be back shortly. Until then...
Ta-ta. <lacht>